Good evening and welcome. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Those of you that have joined me by Facebook Live as well as YouTube, I want to thank those that will brave through this uh, rain. I said extemporaneously, but it is, we've had a downpour and thank God for it. Thank God for it. But thank you again for joining me. Let's continue our series on the rewards of righteous commitment. And this commitment that we're sharing with you tonight is our ability to cooperate, to partner with the Holy Spirit of God. And in partnering with the Holy Spirit or cooperating with him, then we're able to win the war, the war within, that tug of war, that battle, that struggle of flesh versus spirit. And so I want to go back to um, Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. And you're probably wondering, oh, my God, when are we going to leave this? Uh, we've just got a few more things that we want to share with you. But I want to, I cannot exhaust the word of God, but I do want to bring the principles from God's word that you can properly apply to the necessary areas of your life. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, thank you for those that have joined with us tonight. And I pray your choice blessings upon their household. I thank you, Father, for doors, doors that you're opening, ways that you're making, opportunities that you're creating so that we can walk circumspectively according to your will. Give us to understand and to know what the will of the Lord is. Father, give us that assurance assure our hearts uh, through the spirit of what you have spoken to us and then teach us how to rest in the promises of God, to rest in your anointing and to fight the good fight of faith and to lay hold on eternal life. I thank you that every household represented here tonight, that they will receive health and healing and wholeness, that there will be more than enough that is needed in their household, that they will have a more income than they have outgo. I thank you for regulating our minds, our thoughts, and bringing us into that place of renewal and revitalization. Thank you for the strength of God today in the name of Jesus. Now give us the wisdom of your word, the insight, the understanding, the ability to comprehend the spiritual truths that you would have us to know. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. All the people said amen. Uh, you do have a one, uh, an opportunity to like and share this tonight. And if you're not uh, viewing it live with me, uh, you can share it so others can view and receive these principles. Let's talk about something that's close to my heart and dear to my heart because I find that it is one of those things that most believers struggle with. And it's a tug of war. It's that fight between the flesh and the spirit. It's being able to be led by the spirit, guided by the spirit, so that you and I can resist the devil, restrain our flesh, and make righteous choices. And so as we talk about cooperating, cooperating, partnering, agreeing with the Holy Spirit of God, that it's not just a, a fight with the spirit, but we're to flow with him. And uh, as those of us that have come up in the church of God in Christ, uh, our theme song is, yes, Lord. We want to be able to say yes to him, yes to his will, yes to his way, yes to his word. Yes, we will obey. Let me go over a couple of things before I get into tonight's lesson. And tonight I want to talk about the twofold action of the Holy Spirit to keep the corrupt sinful nature, the flesh from controlling our lives. And I will tell you how that the spirit does two things in his twofold action. Number one is something that he releases. Number two, it is something that he does to restrain. He releases his power, his authority, the rights and privileges, his grace, his anointing, so that you and I can stand and be the salty salt and illuminating light that God has called us to be. He releases his power in us so that we can develop and maintain the character traits that will sustain us no matter what environment, no matter what kind of attack or assault that we're under, that we're able to maintain certain characteristics. 
And those characteristics are based upon Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23, which is the fruit of the Spirit. And then he restrains. He, he, he wars against. He gives us the power, the wherewithal, the ability, the performance through the anointing to fight against those things that would try to subjugate us to the dictates, the appetites, and desires of our flesh. So the Holy Spirit in our lives is more than just goosebumps and chills and uh, just uh, a funny feeling. He is the power of God. He is the anointing of God. He is the one that executes and administers the perfect will of God in our lives. And then he equips you and I. He gives us the tools wherewith you and I can take the truth, the word, and come into a place of freedom and liberation where we're living above and not beneath our rights and privileges. And then I'm going to talk about, lastly, cooperating with the Holy Spirit, what it means to walk in the Spirit and being led by the Spirit and conforming to uh, the directions and guidance of the Spirit. That in that process, there is a renewal or revitalization that takes place. That he's constantly renewing us. We are being transformed. We are coming into a place where we are reflecting not only the glory of God in our lives, but those characteristics that reflects the nature and the personality of Jesus Christ. That we have been indwelt by the Spirit of God, number one, to be saved. We're filled with the Spirit of God so that we can do the works of Christ, not only maintain the character traits, but to fulfill our assignment, to do the plan of God, to know what the will of God is, and to have victory in every aspect of our lives. Let me read my scripture tonight, Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. This is what it says. I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, this I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the desires or the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusted uh, against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one to the other. So that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Let me just kind of um, refresh your, your memory on some of the things that we've kind of shared up to this point. And one of the things I've talked about is the operating system uh, in your life, that there was an operating system before conversion, before you got saved, before you were born again. Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And this is why you need the twofold action of the Holy Spirit in your life that endows you with an anointing, with his presence, that releases you into a place of freedom and liberty and then restrains, give you the ability to say no to the enemy. And so he says that we become a new creation in Christ Jesus. I gave you this diagram last week and showed you um, the tripartite of man, that man is made up of body, soul, and spirit, and how that the spirit is the controlling factor in all of our lives and how the Holy Spirit penetrates our spirit and our spirit is guided or led by in cooperation with the Holy Spirit of God. Now you say, what happens if I if I sin or fall short? It's all a part of the covenant. First John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, for so long, people, they would make a mistake and then they felt like that they couldn't come back to church, that that was it. That I've come short. I, I missed the mark. I couldn't keep uh, the, all of the uh, do's and don'ts uh, that the church set up, all the rules and regulations. So I might as well go back into the world. My friends, that's the trick of the enemy. What you've got to do is learn how to utilize the twofold action of the Holy Spirit that keeps the corrupt, sinful nature, your flesh, from controlling your lives by what he gives through releasing as well as restraining. Paul says here in Galatians 5, 16, but I say walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, responsible to and controlled and guided by the Spirit, and then you will certainly not gratify, listen now, 
the cravings and desires of the flesh of human nature without God. So remember, I just said to you previously that before we got saved, born again, sanctified, however you want to call it, uh, converted, became a Christian, that we uh, the operating system that we were under was the flesh, that we were controlled and dominated by the authority of the flesh. But Jesus came to condemn sin in the flesh to give us the righteousness of God through him. So now I'm not living through my flesh. I'm living by the spirit. And I'll show you that in Romans 8. And that's what he means by saying to us, there's therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So my desire is not to fulfill or to cooperate with my flesh. Come on. But to cooperate with the spirit of this new life or the newness of life that I've taken on. And then I've got to be taught, trained, brought into an understanding of what are the requirements of this new life? What are the benefits of living for God? You know, people just told us all of the stuff that we shouldn't do, but they didn't tell us all the things that we could do and all of the benefits and rewards for not subjecting ourselves to an old operating system under the flesh, but to cooperate with this new operating system that comes through the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost, this power, is to release us into a place of liberation, liberty, freedom, as well as to give us the power to restrict and restrain the flesh's authority in our lives. I wish I had time. I wish I had time. I don't want to have to go all the way back. Uh, but look at look at Romans 6. Romans 6 says this. Do you have time for this, family? Do you have time for this? Romans 6 says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin, live any longer therein. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ was baptized into his death. So now our identity has changed. Our appetites have changed. we become a new creature, a new creation in Christ. And listen to what he says is, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. So we have an obligation. Since we've been changed, since he has given us this power, we have an obligation to cooperate or to partner with the Holy Spirit of God so that we have the ability to be led by him, to walk in the Spirit, and to conform to the image of Jesus Christ. And then let me read a few more verses and then I'll come back to Romans 8. He says, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, listen now, I told you we're under a new operating system. Our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed. So that your, your, your soulish man, your flesh, does not have authority or dominion over you. The Holy Spirit comes to release you from the bondage of sin. So that you can walk now in the newness of life and in this freedom that God gives. Let me read a little bit further. And so he says that the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve sin. You see, what the flesh wants to do is serve sin. And what the spirit wants you to do is to serve God. Are you hearing me tonight? So our operating system before conversion or before we were born again or sanctified is the flesh, the sinful nature that caters to our own desires, appetites, uh, uh, and is wide open to Satan's influence. But the flesh is not eradicated. Listen now. And this is what messes a lot of people up. They think the moment they are born again, that the flesh is eradicated by the spirit. Rather than being eradicated, it is circumvented as we learn to follow the spirit. Following, partnering, cooperating with the spirit. Following his flow. 
adjusting to his leadership, listening to his voice, obeying what he says, hearing his voice clearly so that we will know what is expected of us and what are, what's required of us. You see, the church sometimes puts a lot of stuff on us that God didn't. Through our rules and legalism and regulations, the church put stuff on us that God did not require. Because we wanted to appear to be holy by pulling off certain things we thought, but yet the heart had not been changed. And there was no total cooperation or partnering with the Holy Ghost. Some people are so afraid of, a Holy, of the Holy Ghost's power and his strength as though something foreign or something foreign is going to happen to you. I remember growing up and people were afraid of uh, holiness people, Pentecostal people, because they thought they was sprinkling some dust or something on you and that, you know, you would go into some weird, weird situation. That's not what it's all about. When you receive the Holy Spirit of God and, and you're baptized in the Spirit and you're being filled with the Spirit, you're just coming under the leadership of the Holy Spirit and you're allowing him to lead you and to guide you and to provide what he has been assigned to do. I said that twofold action of the Holy Spirit is to keep the corrupt, sinful nature, your flesh, from controlling your lives. And he does that through what he releases and what he restrains. Let me read a couple of more scriptures here in Romans 7. It says, verse 7, so for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. For if in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon, that, that's a an accounting word, which means to count. Reckon, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, let therefore let not sin therefore reign a rule in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. That's what your flesh wants you to do. That's that old operating system. Let me get me a little swallow of tea tonight. So many times people were thrown off because they thought receiving the Holy Spirit of God or the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a means to an end. That that's all that was it. Once I had gotten baptized in the Holy Ghost, I didn't have to do anything. You've got to cooperate with him. You've got to be led by him. You've got to be guided by him. You have to allow him to instruct you. And we would work for a gift. Work to be filled. And once we got filled, it's like we sat down and that was it. And then the enemy would steamroll over us because we didn't know how to partner or cooperate with the Holy Spirit so that he could bring us into those places, the twofold action where he releases and he restrains. He releases the authority, the power, the benefits, the anointing uh, so that you and I can live liberated and free from our flesh, free from sin, live above sin, not sin's dominion or authority or control, but to live above it so that it has no authority over us. But we are operating in authority by what the Holy Spirit releases as we cooperate with him. And then the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to, to restrain the wherewithal, the power. I'll show you that in just a moment. So the flesh is powerless to resist sin's temptation, but not apart from the Holy Spirit of God. It is through the Holy Spirit of God that you and I are brought into a place where we are able to cooperate with the Holy Ghost. And rather than our mind, emotions, thoughts, and imagination running wild with us and taking us off on a rabbit trail or somewhere over here, we can control those thoughts by what the Holy Spirit releases. Amen. So when I talk to you about walking in the spirit, to walk in the spirit means that we yield to his control. We follow his lead. We allow him to exert his influence. Now, my flesh always want to show out. 
My flesh always want to do its own thing. My flesh always wants to make the decision before I talk to God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Lean not to thine own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him, who? Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Ghost, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. So when I follow him and trust his leadership, he brings me into a place. Now listen at this. In 2 Corinthians 2.14, it says this, Now thanks be unto God, who always causes us to triumph in Christ and make it manifest the save of his knowledge by us where? In every place. So rather than my flesh dictating to me what I ought to do and should do, then I'm leaning on the relationship that I have in cooperating or partnering with the Holy Spirit of God. That he's not some foreign entity just outside of me, but he lives inside of me. He is actually what I call the resident truth teacher. That he lives in, he has res, he has taken a bold in my heart. And so he's there to make the corrections, to help me make the adjustments, to do what needs to be done. And so when I cooperate with him, then I'm fulfilling what the scripture says in Ephesians 4 and 30. It says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. I grieve him when I don't allow him to release what he desires to release in my life. Let's go back. Go back up. Let me see. Where am I? Go back up to the twofold action. There we go. There we go. The twofold action of the Holy Spirit is to keep the corrupt, sinful nature, the flesh, from controlling our lives. The Spirit releases and the spirit restrains. Now, let's let's look at this. Let's look at this. I told you that most people feel like that once they get saved and they get filled with the Holy Spirit, that the flesh is eradicated. But it's still there. You're still living in a body that hadn't been redeemed yet. Your body hadn't been redeemed. It hadn't been changed. And you still have a soul that's there. But your soul is to be controlled by your spirit. And this is why you got to get some word in you so that you can use your willpower and your disciplines to bring you into that place where you're constantly cooperating and partnering with the Holy Spirit of God. If we develop a relationship with the Holy Ghost and not feel like it's just some, uh, something outside of me, some, some strange feeling, some goosebumps, some uh, get real tight sweat. No, no. He is the personality of God. He's been assigned to you and I. He is to walk with us, talk with us, so that you and I can come into that place where we're living a victorious and overcoming life. I don't, I don't, I don't want my life to be uh, like a roller coaster, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Rather than going down, the Holy Spirit is there to level me out before I get there. Before there's a massive drop off the cliff. I, I'm not just wait, waiting to get to the end and then drop off the cliff. I, I need something that I'm going to keep moving forward. That there is consistency in my walk with God. Consistency in my journey. Consistency in every aspect of my life. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about cooperating with the Holy Spirit of God. We're saying that we cannot give in give in to our flesh, that this operating system, we have a new operating system in us before we were saved, before we was converted, before we was changed, before we were sanctified. The operating system was the, was the totality of our flesh. We had to, couldn't help us. We did, we, that's all we did. Whatever our flesh told us, that's what we did. Whether it felt good or was good or bad, we didn't care how it affected others. We did whatever our flesh told us. But when we got saved, then we had a new operating system. And that new operating system comes through and by the Holy Spirit of God. Now, let's turn back over to Galatians chapter 5. And I want to read verses 16 from the Amplified and show you uh, what I mean when I say that, um, that the Spirit releases. We can't do this. I'm telling you, you cannot do this apart from the Holy Spirit's control. You can't. There's no way that we can live an overcoming life. If it was that easy, 
then there would be no need for the Holy Spirit. There would be no need to read the Bible, uh, to trust God, to obey God, uh, to live by its principles, uh, because we'd have everything that we need. But because we have flesh, there's a flesh man there. And as Paul said in, in Romans 7, when I would to do good, evil is always there. I, I don't have to create the e evil. Listen, you never have to teach a child the negative. It's, it's there. Uh, we're born separated, born uh, alienated from God. We have to be brought into the knowledge and understanding and awareness of God. You don't have to teach a child a lie. It's just something that happens. It's a part of the Adamic nature. It's a part of their flesh. And so what we have to teach them is the right way, the right thing. We got to teach them the truth because in the soul of man, in his flesh, there is no truth. He doesn't live by the truth of God. And the laws were created as a reminder. It was like a schoolmaster to bring us. The law is not uh, the spirit of God, but it was a schoolmaster to bring us into an awareness of the knowledge of God, of where we've missed God, where we've come short of his glory, where we missed the mark, where we didn't follow through, where we didn't obey. But the law within itself. You just can't keep all the laws. They couldn't in Jesus' time. There were 619 laws, and they couldn't keep them every day. And so he came as the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And so Galatians 6, when we talk about the twofold action of the Holy Ghost to keep the corrupt, sinful nature of the flesh from controlling our lives, I said to you that it has two actions. Number one, it has the ability to release. Now, let's see what he releases here. Verse 16 says, but I say, walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, responsible to and controlled and guided by the Spirit. Then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and desires of the flesh or human nature without God. So the Holy Spirit frees us from bondage. The bondage to to of the corrupt sinful nature. We're free. That's the first thing that happens when you get saved. The guilt complex is gone. The guilt is removed. The shame is removed. The condemnation is gone. Let's go back to Romans 8. You got time for this? Let's go back to Romans 8. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation. Uh, in, the, um, in the Amplified, it says no uh, guilty, uh, guiltiness of wrong for those who are in Christ, who live and walk not after the dictates of the flesh, but after the dictates of the spirit. So we're living to please God, not to please ourselves, but to please God. Not just to keep a set of laws and legalistic rules and all of the do's and don'ts that a church or an organization puts together, sometimes we find that we can't do it. We can't keep all of your legalistic uh, uh, rules. And so people fall short. They feel like, well, I can't do this. It's too hard to live like this. Not realizing that we need the Holy Spirit. We have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit so that, first of all, he releases us or frees us from the bondage of our sales. And so the Bible says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Romans 8 and 2, hath made us free from the law of sin and death. So we're not bound. We don't have to adhere to that. And then verse 3 says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. So it didn't matter how many laws that people tried to keep. They couldn't keep them. They couldn't fulfill the law. They couldn't do it apart from the Holy Spirit of God. So he says, it's not the law. He said, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That's what I said to you, that uh, the, uh, the dominion, the, the authority of sin that it had over us, the Holy Spirit releases us from that bondage. If we make a choice, there are three things that we have to, you have to keep in mind uh, that we're obligated to do. 
in cooperating with the Holy Spirit and walking with God. We are we are obligated, number one, to resist the devil. And you can't do that apart from the Holy Ghost. Secondly, to restrain our flesh. You can't restrain your flesh without the help of the Holy Spirit. And number three, to make righteous choices. That if I owe you anything, if I'm obligated to the body to do anything, that's what you expect of me. That's what we expect of each other. That's what God wants from us. Resist the devil, restrain our flesh, and make righteous choices. Every day. Every day of our lives, those three things we are responsible to perform, to do. Every day that you live, the devil is going to show up somewhere through somebody. Some way. It may be some system. It may be some institution. It may come through a person. It may come through something that is put in place. But you, you're going to see the devil. He's going to show his hand. And then we have, we have to restrain our flesh. How do we do that? We do it through our disciplines. We do it through our willpower. We do it through the word of God. We got to get some truth in us. And if we don't get the truth in us, then we won't know what to do. So this is why it's necessary that you and I read the Bible, study the Bible. Uh, Psalms 119 verse 11 says, wherewith, wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? It says by taking heed to the word of God. Also in Psalms 119, it says the word of the Lord, the word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So his word is what shines light or illuminates the dark areas that I can't see. And so when we talk about cooperating and walking in the Holy Spirit, there's nothing weird or strange. And, you know, for the longest, people have just tried to make it so, so, um, so, um, so, uh, requiring so much that people say, oh, my God, uh, uh, really? Uh, I've got to do all of that uh, get, to get to that place? Because they make it so hard for us as though, you know, you're doing it all. You, you can't do it. This is why we have to rely on the Holy Spirit to release within us that freedom from the bondage of the corrupt sinful nature. We cannot change ourselves. We cannot make it happen on our own. So he says the law couldn't do it. So he had to send Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 4, Romans 8, that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for they that are after the flesh do mind things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded. That word carnal is just a flat word meaning flesh. Those that are fleshly minded is death, but the spiritual minded is life and peace. So if I live according to what my flesh dictates to me, I'm going to end up, uh, without the joy and the peace and the power that God wants me to have. But if I walk according to the spirit and maintain a spirit, spirit mind, then I will have life and peace. And it says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God and neither can be. Now, so I said that the spirit releases, he frees us from the bondage of, of, of the corrupt sinful nature. And then not only that, but the spirit restrains. You got that? Yeah, there it is. Look at verse 17 and 18 uh, in Galatians 5. You there with me? Galatians uh, chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Now, this is what he restrains. He says, for the desires, I'm reading from the Amplified, for the desires of the flesh are opposed to the Holy Spirit. And the desires of the spirit are opposed to the flesh, the godless human nature. For these are antagonistic to each other. They are continually withstanding and in conflict with each other so that you're not free. Remember I said that he releases us to come into a place of freedom where we're living above and not beneath. And so he says here, but you're not so that you're not free, but are prevented from doing what you desire to do. There's a lot of people that want to really please God and want to walk with God. But you can't do it apart from his spirit, apart from the Holy Spirit. 
listening to him, allowing him to guide you, allowing him to speak to you. And you must know his voice. So he says, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the appetites of the flesh. That's Galatians uh, uh, 5, 16. So when we do that, then we're brought into a place where we're cooperating with the Holy Spirit. Let me let me summarize this. Walking, Galatians 5, 16 says, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So we have a responsibility to walk. That's activity. We got to live by the spirit of God. Remember last week I told you that your body responds to uh, sensory impulses. Uh, the, there, there are five senses. I think it's touch, feel, hearing, taste, uh, seeing. I think that's, that's right. I think that's fine. And that's what it responds to. That's why everything now is about an image. And that image is to create an imprint. Uh, certain images, we just see things in image, images, images, images. I said to you last week, uh, what does a naked woman have to do with selling me a car? It's an image to create an imprint. And so once I see that, then the imprint is there. And I'm going to remember that image, either the car or the woman. And whatever, whichever one appeals to my flesh, that's what I'll go after. All right. So not only walking, but then being led. We've got to be led. And it says, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So the leadership of the Spirit of God is that I'm obeying what he's saying. When I pray, I expect to hear. When I pray, I expect not only to hear, but to receive. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11, it says this, Ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone that asketh, receive it. To him that seeketh, find it. And to him that knocketh, the door will be opened. A-S-K. It is the passion of prayer. And prayer is asking. It's a request. It's a dialogue. It's a conversation. And in that conversation, we make our needs known to God. So being led, if we're led by the Spirit, we are willing and able to talk to God, the Holy Spirit, about any and everything. And then conforming. Uh, chapter 5 of, of Galatians, verse 25 in the NIV says, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Don't allow Him to be a stranger to you. Know His voice. Receive His guidance. Allow Him to teach you. Allow Him to direct you. He does not want to be a stranger to us because He does not want you and I to give up at any point in time. And although there may be struggles and conflicts, there's always the tug of war, the flesh versus the spirit. But we give in to the spirit because we want life and peace. We want life and peace. And when we become spiritually minded, we take on life and peace, life and peace. First John chapter one, verses six and seven, verse nine says, if we claim to have fellowship with him. Yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. And then he goes on to tell us that if we confess our sins, that he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So we have to understand that even when we sin after receiving the spirit, that Jesus is atonement covers us. We just have to repent and ask for forgiveness. And when we confess our sins, we get back to walking in the light. And uh, for so long, we have been, uh, we've been taught uh, in a way that uh, people make a mistake, they sin, they fall short. And, and rather than uh, coming back or staying with God, uh, they, uh, they are treated as though they have just uh, murdered someone. You know, people look on them as disdain. And I don't know why or what for, because the scripture says, if we confess, that means to agree with God that, hey, hey, I missed it today. I didn't make the 10. I got a 9.5. Uh, you were looking for a 10. I missed it. I missed the mark. Uh, forgive me for that. He forgives us. It cleanses us. 
And then we start walking back in the light. He doesn't remove the light from us. He's not like people. He, just, he doesn't just take it from us. A prime example is that children don't learn to walk immediately. They start crawling, you know. I mean, it, it's a process. They start pulling up on things because now their legs, arms, everything has to be strengthened so that they can uh, continue to make the movement. Uh, they'll toddle for a while, and before they're able to walk confidently, they'll toddle, they'll fall, but they, you know, you just, you grab their hands, you study them, come on, come on, you keep encouraging them, you can walk, you can do this, and the moment you see them make them steps by themselves, all oh, the joy that you get, this is the way it is when we cooperate with the Holy Spirit. He doesn't take us and throw us over to the side. So all you ought to be walking by. No, no. He's, he's guiding us until we can get the strength that we need. Strengthen our legs. Strengthen our arms. Coordination that we need. So, And then he's holding us and guiding us so that every step that we make, he's showing us this is the activity. This is, this is what it, how, it, how you walk. This is what it takes to walk. But he's holding us and guiding us all along. And then when he sees us able to walk, I mean, what joy the Holy Spirit gets. And it's the same way that uh, when we see our children uh, begin to walk, and even teenagers and adults, they, they, sometimes you'll lose your balance. Sometimes I've been walking, stumble over something, not picking up my feet right, and stumble over. Uh, but, you know, I don't fall out and just lay there. You get up. You keep moving. Sometimes you lose your balance. I was on the, uh, what is that thing called at the gym that you got me on now? Uh, the uh, stair stepper. What is it? Whatever that thing is. But my coordination was off, and I was going this way when I was supposed to have been going the, the forward. And then from time to time, uh, my foot would slip a little bit. Because I wasn't accustomed to it. Now you put me on the treadmill, I did well on that. But I got on that, the coordination, I'm moving my arms and, and, and my legs. So the coordination was different, but I stayed with it. I didn't just get off of it and say, oh, uh, I'll never be able to handle this. No, 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 no. And, 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 and I made a little stumble, but I stayed with it. So I lost my balance the, uh, last night, but I stayed with it. And until I, I'm able to master it, and I'm going to master it, and that's the way it is with partnering, cooperating with the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit. It is nothing uh, that makes you weird or strange, but it brings you into that place where you understand that you're gradually becoming who God called you to be. You're walking in the Spirit. Our character's changing. The character development, the character traits, we're reflecting that. We're becoming the salty salt and the illuminating light. And it's gradual. It doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen. And that's what I want to get all of us to see. And, and, and so the scripture teaches us that, that the change, uh, it happens. The changes that you are desiring and looking for in your life, they will happen and they will come to pass. So all we need to do is cooperate with the spirit and allow him to cause uh, allow him to release within us the ability to free us up and liberate us from the bondage of our flesh by saying yes to him and obeying him. And then his ability to restrain and restrict the flesh's power or the enemy's power so that you and I have the power to resist the devil, restrain our flesh, and make righteous choices. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for all that you've done. Thank you for your bountiful blessings. Thank you for your goodness and grace. Thank you for the grace to stand. Thank you for power over ourselves, power over our thought life. Thank you, Father, that you've given us, you've placed within us a decider, the ability to choose to make righteous choices. And so I ask that you would give us the ability that this coming week, the rest of this week, that we make perfect choices, perfect decisions for the rest of the week. Enable us to be guided by you in our thoughts, in our decision making, in our will. Help us to be all that you would have us to be. Teach us how to master our feelings and to rule by our choices. In the name of Jesus Christ.
Amen and amen. Lord bless you tonight. Thank you, those of you that have joined us in in person worship as well as uh, Facebook Live uh, family and YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm gonna uh, I'll continue the series. Um, we're talking uh, next week, and I want to talk to you next week about the function of your spirit in cooperating with the spirit of God. There are three aspects of your spirit, your human spirit, that must align itself with the Holy Spirit and how he's constantly influencing our spirit so that we come in alignment with the perfect will of God in our lives. Amen. Those of you that are listening tonight, if you, um, if you're not saved, you're not committed to Jesus Christ, all of us need three things. We need a friend, we need fellowship, and we need forgiveness. Jesus Christ came, Romans 5 said he's a, uh, he came, um, uh, he's a, 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 the came to give us uh, freedom. He came to give us life and that more abundantly. He's a friend that's sticking closer than a brother. He understands you and I. He became what we were so that he can get us to the place of what he wants us to be. And then forgiveness, forgiveness. First John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteous fellowship. Behold, I stand at the door, Revelation 3 and 20, knock. Then a man hear my voice, open the door, I'll come in, sup with him, and he with me. That word sup means that he will give you the chief meal of the day, what is necessary and needed in your life. I don't know what you're struggling with, what you're up against, what you're confronted with even now. I don't know what your tomorrow holds. I don't know what the rest of your night is going to be like. But I want you to know this, that Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, can enable you and strengthen you and help you through any difficulty in any circumstance or any event that has hit your life, that he has the power over the enemy. If that's you, and you said, I just need this Jesus. All you've got to do, according to Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, what say that the word is neither even in the mouth, the word of faith with we preach, that if thou believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth, that Jesus Christ is Lord, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If that's you, believe God. Go to our website. You see it on the screen, www.empoweredoutreachchurch.org. And we're going to rush a little book that we have for you. Um, here it is. What on Earth Am I Here For? by Rick Warren. It's a mini book. This is our gift to you. You've made that decision. There's also an opportunity on the website for a prayer request. There's an opportunity if you want to become a member. There's an uh, opportunity on that uh, website for you to do that. Amen. Let me give you an opportunity to um, sow a seed, return your tithe. If this is your week to tithe, I want you to do that. Give you an opportunity to uh, sow a seed into the work of God, what God has us doing here. On the website, there are two ways to give, uh, Givelify and PayPal, Givelify and PayPal. Those that are in the sanctuary, uh, we do have an envelope system uh, if you want to use that. I want to wrap this prayer around your seed and your tithe tonight. I believe that God has given me uh, the mandate as well as the authority through my assignment to pronounce a blessing upon your household. The scripture says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, shall men give into your bosom. The same measure you meet, it shall be measured unto you. The investment that you make into the Lord's house and the work of the Lord, God says that he will give you some 30, 60, 100 fold, 100 fold return. Bring you all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. Prove me now herewith, said the Lord, and I will open to you the windows of heaven. Pour you out a blessing you won't have room enough to see. I don't know how he does it, but God has a way to take the 10. We have the 90, and it's as though we've never missed the 10. And so God is a God of faithfulness. He's committed to us. And the scripture, I want to pray this scripture over you, uh, 2 Corinthians 9 and 8. Those of you that are sharing your uh, tithe or seed tonight, or if, um, whenever you plan to give it, if it's this week, 
to do that. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, you said in your word that you would make all grace abound toward us, that we have an all sufficiency in all things. They are bound to every good work. I decree and declare household blessings, prosperity, health and healing and wholeness. I thank you for household salvation that our children will be saved. I thank you for doors that you're opening, ways that you're making, opportunities that you're giving. Thank you for strengthening us and keeping us in the center of your divine will. We bless you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give you a couple of announcements and then I'm going to let you go. Thank you for the few extra minutes uh, that you've given me tonight. On this Sunday, this coming Sunday, we say all in at 10, our own first lady, Lady Kathy Davis, is going to be sharing the word with us this coming Sunday. We're excited about this. This is Women in Ministry Sunday, fifth Sunday. of Every uh, every time we have a fifth Sunday, the women in ministry, they go for. And so she's going to be our speaker this coming Sunday. I want you to pray for her. We're believing for a tremendous outpouring, good word from the Lord, uh, wonderful, exciting worship. And we look forward to those of you that's coming. Make sure that uh, we have uh, suspended you having to go online and register. If you want to do that, you're welcome to do that. But just show up, be a part. Uh, we look forward to your coming and being a part of the service uh, this coming Sunday, 10 a.m., as we uh, worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Don't forget the prayer every Tuesday and Friday morning. 6 a.m. from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., the War Room Prayer. It is by conference call only, and that number is 712-432-3900. The access code is 328901-POUND. Amen? Look forward to seeing each of you. And remember, I'll see you in the breakthrough. Be blessed.